ritual, ritual or reformation. It's the message for this week. Remember what God said to Cain. Sin is crouching at your door. It desires to have you, but you must rule over it. Well, I say that sin has you in its grasp, that you've already killed your brother and the time has come for the wrath of God. The only difference between us and the crowds coming out to be baptized by John is that we do not cry out. What shall we do then? Instead, we continue in our ways and our rituals. All the while the world is on fire, we speak of corrupt leaders, we complain of vaccine mandates, toilet paper shortages, yet people all around us are living lives not knowing of Jesus Christ and his Holy Spirit. People are perishing for all eternity into the place of weeping and gnashing of teeth, says Jesus himself. All the while, we continue in our rituals. We keep our faith close to our chests and we don't speak of it outside these walls. The wrath of God is upon us, my friends. It is climate change, it is COVID, it is politics, it's the media, it's church decline. It is our hate, our sin, our refusal to take God at his word, a word that is one not just of hope and joy and love and peace to all mankind, but one of justice. And, oh, the chickens have come home to roost. Friends, this is how John the Baptist spoke to the crowds. There was no mincing words. There was no mucking around. In fact, John was almost cruel to them. So these people had come to him for help. And look what they get. They had come because they could see the writing on the wall. They could see that the world was broken. A world that was on fire. And their hope was that he was the Messiah. A hope that he would just fix everything. Well, today... Apart from offending everybody, I'm speaking to myself, of course. Apart from that, we're going to have a look at Luke. Chapter 3, verses 7 to 18, where John the Baptist speaks harsh and sharp words. Not to condemn his people. It's never what this is about. But instead to wake them up. To help them turn their rituals into a reformation. Ritual to reformation. It's a challenge that carries on to this day. But we humans, we're really good at making rituals out of just about everything. Which is kind of okay to a point. I mean, the ritual of brushing your teeth, that's, that's pretty good. Keep doing that one. The ritual of putting on your seatbelt when you get in the car, who actually thinks about that? You don't, do you? You just get in the car, click, off you go. Who gets to their destination and doesn't even remember driving? Yeah. We have lots of rituals. That one's probably not so okay, but you're getting what I'm saying. But there's a danger with this. But we can use rituals to keep things at arm's length. When was the last time you checked the ingredients of your toothpaste? We can use rituals to keep us from taking ownership and thinking things through. And we can use rituals to avoid real change. And it can be anything from struggling to lose weight because we have a ritual of snacking while watching TV. It could be coming to church week after week, saying the Lord's Prayer, confessing our sin, even taking communion itself, all of it a ritual, all of it by rote and none of it by heart, which begs the question, what are our rituals? What are the things that we do that we take for granted? What are the things that we simply assume without further thought? And how many of these things, if we actually think it through, how many are actually sinful? How many of them are justified because everybody else is doing it? Repeat it over and over without the further thought. Because it's a ritual. And which of these things needs reforming? Which of these things must we drop so we can have a change of heart? Well, this is the question I want us to ask and answer for each of us as we work through what John the Baptist has to say today. But first, let me pray. Lord, thank you for your great love. Open our hearts, open our minds to your word, your ways, and your truth. In Jesus' name, amen. John said to the crowds, coming out to be baptized by him, you brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the coming wrath? 
Now, John's not just speaking to the weak, self-serving, narcissistic, unrepentant politicians of his day. I don't regret saying that from last week. But he also is clearly speaking to the people, those who have been oppressed by these rulers. Clearly, they were expecting John to speak up for them, to rescue them, to lead a protest. But he doesn't. Instead, he turns on them, doesn't he? It's almost as if he is victim shaming when he tells them in verse 8, in no uncertain terms, you produce fruit in keeping with repentance. These people are suffering under the weight of corrupt leaders and Roman rule. And John speaks not to the rulers and the corruption, but to them. You produce fruit in keeping with repentance. And do not begin to say to yourselves, forget the excuses. Don't say to yourselves, oh, we've got Abraham as our father. For I tell you that out of these stones, God can raise up children for Abraham. See, they thought that their salvation, their guarantee of, of heaven and an eternity, it was linked to a literal birthright. And that may have been true to a point at one stage. But it's a bit like the wealth of the baby boomers that you're about to pass on to the next generation. You know, the money's coming, everybody. Let me unpack this. We have Abraham as our father with a story. One thing I really enjoy about street evangelism, I mean, it puts a spring in my step for the whole week. It's just great. You know, it makes doing the things you love often makes the things that are more difficult, more bearable, doesn't it? And using the gifts that God gives you, there's no other, I don't think there's anything else that can really bring that reward that makes all the harder stuff um, bearable. And street evangelism is one of the joys that I love. And, you know, I get to share the gospel with people. We call them divine encounters where someone's really interested in and you get to be that neighbor that Keith was talking about. And, and it's just wonderful. You don't know where that seed's going to go, but you know that it will always go somewhere. And that's, that's important. Now, the other thing I get to do is I get to hear people's stories, people who don't come to church. I get to hear a bit about what's important to them. Now, before I do share this story I'm getting there, is that just know that I've kind of, I've, I've taken out the specifics. I don't want anyone, even a complete stranger, to think that I've, um, you know, betrayed their trust. Besides, I'm fairly sure that I could have this conversation with most of us, including myself. One person we spoke to on Monday, or I spoke to, she was so pleased, so thankful for the lockdowns. And I heard garden just loved her for it. You should have seen it. This corner block, massive garden. And it was just amazing. And it wasn't there before lockdown, right? She, the garden just loved her for it. She articulated just loving the time together as a family without distraction. Now, I'm sure many of us could agree, generally speaking, with such a statement. I know my pets loved lockdown. And they really loved it. But ultimately, I'm embarrassed to say that I really enjoyed lockdown. But did you know this, this response, this, this, this response of a good lockdown experience? It's a matter of demographics, a matter of privilege and wealth. It's a matter of birthright. Take a relatively safe family environment, continued income, decent internet, your own home, a secure job, and surprise, surprise, lockdowns are a blessing. COVID itself is a blessing. Take unlimited vaccine supply, great hospitals. And friends, we've got nothing really to be concerned about. And many of us live in the hope that Omicron might bring back the blessing. Mm, this is what some of us are thinking, but others are wincing. Can you say that? Lockdown was horrible. In fact, some of us are still in lockdown. Now, I know it's not right to think this way. I know that what I'm effectively doing, I'm saying not only to COVID, but to all the troubles of the world, to climate change, to the threat that is China, to the 3 million people who have died from COVID this year, to the 8 million children who have died from diseases as a result of poverty. I'm saying to them, too bad, so sad. I don't need to change or do anything different. I have Abraham as my father. 
See, a good lockdown experience requires misplaced trust in a birthright, which in our case is personal wealth and the wealth of our nation. It's the same thing that the generations were doing before John came. That is, until it got bad enough for them to even consider that this thing, this birthright that they take for granted, it may not be enough. Before it got bad enough that they would be driven to repentance and they would seek God and the Messiah that he promised. But what about us? Are we ready? Or is our hope, has our security, our blessing been placed in something other than Christ? I mean, do we really think that our wealth will protect us If China does to us what they just did to Lithuania, for those who don't know, they just wrote them out of the map. No more exports to you. No more imports from you. Do you really think our nation can survive years more of these lockdowns and what are effectively self-imposed economic sanctions? Do you think we can really survive that? The Israelites thought their birthright would protect them from Rome. And we know how that turned out. Nearly 2,000 years without a home. My friends, in a heartbeat, God can raise up a new nation. Whatever we take for granted will be taken away. Placing our hope in a man-made birthright is a recipe for disaster, not to mention that it's short-sighted, privileged, and selfish even. But let's have no more of this. Let's look not to the birthright not to the rituals, not to our wealth, not to what we take for granted, but instead let us look to the birth of a king. But why? Because, verse 9, the axe is already at the root of the trees, and every tree that does not produce good fruit will be cut down, thrown into the fire, The reason the crowds are coming out to meet John the Baptist is because they, unlike my friend with the nice garden, they can see what's coming. And they can see they've got no defense against it. Their only option is to place their trust and their hope. This is how desperate they are. They're looking to a man dressed in camel's hair, living in the desert, eating grasshoppers. Think about it. It's huge. And it's not just the crowds, it's the tax collectors, the soldiers. They too can see what's coming. But then what happens next, you would not expect. But one would expect John to stand up and lead a protest with and for his people. Form an army, or coin a phrase, start the great reset. But no, this is not how he answers them. But look at how he answers them. Their question from verse 10. What should we do then? They've got it, haven't they? What shall we do then? It's the most challenging, most radical statement, I think, in all of Luke chapter 3. What should we do then? If everything you say is true, what shall we do? It's challenging because to ask this question, to form these words on our lips and to mean them from our hearts, we must be prepared to look past our birthright, to look past our rituals, the things we take for granted. And let me say something really offensive if I haven't already today. I'm speaking to myself, just remember that. While doing street evangelism, if I come up to a house, one of those ones with the perfect lawn, you know the sort, it's the edges are just spot on. Yeah, well, look, don't. They're spot on. The grass is thick and lush, and you can you can just want to lay on it, don't you? It's like spongy, and you want to kind of like do this. Oh. If I come up to a house like that, and if there's a new caravan out the front or a big boat, I can guarantee you, like almost without question, that I will not get two words out of my mouth before they say no, thank you, not interested, and turn their back on me without fail. Knock on a housing commission door and you get a completely different response. What shall we do then? Who amongst us is prepared to ask this question? What shall we do then? Well, John answers in verse 11. 
Anyone who has two shirts should share with the one who has none. And anyone who has food should do the same. What shall we do then? We should be generous. It's almost too easy, isn't it? Like all that build up, we just need to be generous. It's harder than you think. You've got nice lawns and a caravan. Be extra generous. Be so generous that you don't have time to keep your lawn looking so good. That's the challenge here, isn't it? Or how about this? Instead of buying that bigger van or the bigger boat or going on that expensive holiday, make a decision to actually just give that money away. We could certainly use it. It doesn't have to be to the church. It can be to anybody in need. Why? Because the obvious is the right thing to do. We're going to need to be like the shrewd manager. It's a parable of Jesus in Luke 16, if you want to go and read it. And this is because we're going to need friends when God takes away what's underpinning our wealth, when God takes away our birthright and gives it to someone else. Now, you might not have the perfect lawn. I know I don't. My neighbours tell me often. But perhaps you're buying so much stuff online that the boxes won't fit in the bin. Guilty. You might not have the perfect lawn, but you waste your time, hours on unproductive things when you could have actually been generous or served or helped someone. Social media, TV series, on and on it goes. You might not have the perfect lawn, but you spend more money on takeout and dinners out than you tithe to your church. All of these rituals, they're rituals because we don't think more about them. They prevent the kind of change, turnaround that we see here in verse 12. Even tax collectors came to be baptized. Even tax collectors were repenting. Teacher, they asked, what shall we do? Don't collect any more than you're required to, John told them. Be honest, why? Because so much of our sin is justified because everyone else is doing it. Their lawn's great. Mine should be. They spent all night on Netflix. Why can't I? They buy takeout and coffees constantly. I'm just trying to keep up. Why can't I? Or how about this one? Government taxes are unfair, so let's not pay them. The technical term is tax minimization. I was pretty good at that. I was in business, remember? But why are they doing this? Why is the tax collector concerned? They've got the perfect lawn. They've got the big boat. They've got the caravan. Why are they concerned? Well, I can think of two reasons. Perhaps they're not happy with what their bosses are making them do. We're seeing all sorts of professional people protesting now. Perhaps they're just not happy with what they've been made to do. Or perhaps they can simply see the writing on the wall. They can see what's coming and they know this wealth that they've built up for themselves is not going to help them. But it's not just the crowds, is it? Not just the wealthy tax collectors, but it's the soldiers too. These are the Romans, the Gentiles. In verse 14, then some soldiers asked him, and what shall we do? Everybody's asking this question, aren't they? What shall we do? And he replied, don't extort money and don't accuse people falsely. Be content with your pay. Be content. Do we really need more shopping, more social media, a bigger house, faster internet, a new caravan, maybe even a new laptop or that device? Well, no, ultimately none of it's going to help, is it? None of it's going to save us from the coming wrath. Besides the desire to take more and buy more, it's actually rooted in our desire to take control. See, when uncertainty is in the future, and we, you know, like, you've got to be pretty blind if you think our future is certain. It's pretty obvious. It's very uncertain. It's, I mean, look what we planned for this weekend, and it's like that. Gone. 
The future is uncertain. When that happens, the response of most people is to take more control of the present. It's not going to help because we're not in control. Control is an illusion. And all we have is faith and trust in God. He is in control and he will look after us. Clearly John's message took root in their heart. What must we do then? But is my message taking root in our hearts? Are we responding with what shall I do then? Are we thinking about it? Are we, are we looking around for this Messiah as these people are in verse 16, verse 15? The people were waiting expectantly and were all wondering in their hearts John might possibly be the Messiah. Wait, what? Hold on a second. John just ripped them to shreds, didn't he? He deconstructed their worldview. He pointed out their overconfidence in a birthright. Pointed out their need to repent. And what do these people do? Well, they make another mistake. And look to him. I look to the broken guy with the microphone. The person on the podium for a solution. The problem's not here or out here. The problem's in here. And John answers to this effect. I baptize you with water. In other words, I'm going to point out your sin and I'm going to make no apologies for it. I'm going to show you what's wrong with the world and I'm not going to hold back. And I'm going to facilitate your repentance. The one who is more powerful than I will come and that's Jesus. The straps of whose sandals I am not worthy to untie. Yet Jesus washes their feet and he dies for them on the cross. But it's he who will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. In other words, my baptism may prepare you, but his baptism will purify you. And the people came to John in the hope of a simple, simple solution. Give us a new ruler. Give us a new government. Take us on a protest and all will be well. It's not so, is it? Firstly, we the people, we must recognize our part in the brokenness. We must repent, for it is repentance that prepares the way for the Lord. This is what I'm proclaiming. And finally, just in case anybody needs a big stick to get themselves moving like my children, metaphorically speaking, have a look at verse 17. His winnowing fork is in his hand to clear the threshing floor and to gather the wheat into the barn, but he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. And with many other words, John exhorted the people and proclaimed the good news to them. This winnowing process, the process of separating the useless chaff, for, that's those who are heading for the weeping and gnashing of teeth, from the precious wheat, that's those who are headed for eternity in heaven with perfect justice and perfect love. This process began with Jesus and it still continues today. Let me wrap this up because I want to assure you that I'm speaking to myself as well. This challenge to take my rituals, to take the things that I do and take for granted, to, to reform them into the service of King Jesus, this is for me too. And secondly, I want to assure you that I actually know how generous you are. I know how much you guys love your church and your community and all of this. I want you to know that I know that some of you have hearts so big that this message could weigh you down. Yet for others, I know that this would be water off a duck's back. And for others... It may bring a conviction of some ritual of needs reforming, some birthright that you need to just let go of. It may bring a conviction of some areas where you need to be more generous 
or other areas where you need to be more honest with yourself and with others. There's a tension here, isn't there? A tension that only one can resolve, and that is the Holy Spirit of God. This is what John is on about. Only he can reform the rituals. Only he can give a birthright that never perishes, fades or fails. Only he can break the power of sin and death. So if your heart is heavy with any of this, or perhaps something else that's come to mind, repent, ask for forgiveness. It's not a one-off thing. It's a great and wonderful gift from God to be forgiven. We can offload that thing that's weighing us down. Besides, I think if God convicted us of all our sin the moment we come to faith, I'm pretty sure we'd drop dead on the spot. It's a process. It takes time. And it always ends in rejoicing. It's never about pushing people down. It's exhorting the people. Let me close with a reading from Philippians 4 followed by a prayer of repentance. Because Philippians just prepares us for this season. It's why we did it. It says this in Philippians chapter 4, verse 4, Rejoice in the Lord always. That's where our foundation is. That's, that's the birthright that we want to build our lives on. I will say it again, rejoice. But then there's action. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. He sees what we do. We will be made accountable for it. Don't be anxious about anything. All that stuff out there that's going on, it matters not. We are secure in who we are and who we believe. But by prayer and petition with thanksgiving. So don't do nothing. Do something. Present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ. Jesus, these words were as true the day they were written as they are today. And they were written not just for Philippians, but for you and me. Rejoice in our great God as we come to him with humble hearts and trust in his Saviour, our Saviour. Join with me as we confess our sins before our great God. Heavenly Father, you have loved us with an everlasting love. But we have broken your holy laws and have left undone what we ought to have done. We are sorry for our sins and turn away from them. For the sake of your Son who died for us, forgive us, cleanse us, and change us. By your Holy Spirit, enable us to live for you through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. When we ask for forgiveness, we are forgiven. And the tears become tears of joy. Because God desires that none should perish, but that all should turn to Christ and live. In response to his call, we acknowledge our sin. And God pardons all those who humbly repent and truly believe the gospel. And therefore we have peace with our great God, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.